Um, well, thanks everybody. Uh, like I said, sorry for not being there in person. Uh, I'm gonna not touch much on me at all on the building smart side of things and just talk about sort of the view of the world from a, an architecture firm and sort of what we see happening in open source in AEC. Um, so uh, as was in my description, I don't work on projects all the time, but I work on uh, helping teams set up hard and complex projects. So um, uh, LaGuardia uh, Terminal B here on the screen was a project I worked on from like 2016 to 18, and then I would hand it off to a team. And just before the pandemic, I had helped um, set up our collaboration with WSP, A49, and HOK, and countless other firms as well, DFS, uh, on the uh, renovation of center block. So timing was great that I had made the transition, but that means I'm not um, in Ottawa as much as I used to be. But so on this particular project, my role was to figure out how to how to um, bring together the team of people and technologies to um, both deliver the project, but also um, you might say modernize how heritage is done on on projects from a firm perspective, and it actually builds on work that was done at the Sims Lab. So it's sort of a small world, and I'm assuming that's why I'm part of this discussion today. So I thank you for that. Uh, so just a little bit about HOK. Um, we were founded in 1955. It's a three-letter acronym, Helmuth Obata Kessenbaum. Um, we work on pretty much everything uh, besides industrial, I think is the, the, the best way to say that. Uh, we're sort of sprinkled all over the world. And I, like I said, we work on a um, large variety of, of building types, so much that we have two slides now, and I forgot about that. Um, so the, the way I broke up the presentation is actually start to sort of build up from um, what we'll see from Antonio with IFCJS and start at the bottom level, which is sort of stuff that's being built by users for themselves. Um, let me make sure that's minimized. So the category I have is the sort of user-led tools um, and that are really made, meant to make current tools better for yourself. You know, that's, that's the sort of goal of building on top of these things is basically what we're seeing. So a perfect example of something like this is PyRevit. This was started by somebody that now works for McNeil, the makers of Rhino, but it was really meant to be a... Uh, I know Python, how do we make Python work well on top of Revit? So Revit itself doesn't support Python. So it's not only uh, the use of Python to make tools, it's also the, the ability to adapt Python to the Revit environment. So this is a quite, quite successful thing that came out of an individual user. And it's interesting to see how open source things grow. So that was taken by um, a Swiss architect that works at Herzog and Demiron in Switzerland. That's what a Swiss architect would be, I guess. Um, and uh, made a, a sort of a UI that sits on top of PyRevit called Revitron. Uh, it's still for their, mostly for their for, firm's use, but it's a perfect example of how open source software works and that um, it can be uh, used as a base or it can be you know, a solution in and of itself or it can you know, sort of go in different directions outside of the, the creators. Um, intentions potentially, but it also uh, has the flexibility if you want a license that keeps keeps your control, you can do such a thing. And then if you move a little bit more specific to firms, you have tools like these on the screen. I apologize if they might be small. I'm just showing two examples that um, the unique thing about there is that these are, they're not only open source, they're maintained enough. So you can find them on Rhino for Foods website. This is uh, Wombat, which is a set of tools for Grasshopper, which has spawned thousands of tools. Um, and this is by Woods Baggett, Australian firm. So hence the Wombat, if you haven't picked on it, picked up on it, good Grasshopper and Rhino tools are always named after animals. Uh, Thornton Tomasetti didn't do a very good job and they just went with a boring old TT toolbox. But at the end of the day, um, these are the sort of things you see that um, uh, build on uh, open source, and they don't necessarily all have to be open source, but because it's some of the modules of this 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 toolbox are open source. But at the end of the day, it's slightly more elevated. The firm is going to do the work to not only make them internal tools, but available for others. I think the most successful user-generated side of things is the ladybug tools, and that might 
to some people that haven't been around for many years might not know this, but the actual sort of uh, birth of what are the ladybug tools today was the one of the founders, Mustafa, was working on uh, working at Adrian Smith, Gordon Gale in Chicago, and wanted to automate his process. That um, resulted in in him making the ladybug tools, and it was probably just ladybug and honeybee at that point, but. And then it morphed and changed and got rebuilt several times to the point where I think this collection of tools, ladybug, honeybee, and dragonfly, and uh, to a lesser extent, butterfly, are by far the most sort of successful uh, mass contributor, mass used products we have in, in AEC. I can't think of a, uh, there are projects that have a lot of contributors, but there's oftentimes not many users. But this is an example, I think, Certainly at the large firm level, everybody uses these tools inside of Revit or Rhino or Grasshopper. Um, and it's got a quite large, um, both paid set of maintainers, but there's also most of those maintainers started out as people working at firms or doing, you know, sort of uh, grad school work, adding to them and, and it's grown over time. So, you know, even though this is at this point a commercial uh, open source effort. It started as a user-facing tool, uh, user-developed tool to solve this problem, to solve an individual problem, and it's interesting to see how they grow. At HOK, we we do a lot of th things open source, I, unless it's you know like our enterprise systems. Most things we do these at this point, uh, we default to an open source uh, approach, and by open source, mostly just means picking MIT. We'll, we can talk a little bit about licenses, but Basically, um, you can take it, do whatever you want. We don't care. It's the mentality we have is at this point is everything we have is, um, you know, uh, it's good to have and good to build, but it's nothing, there's nothing particular about it that's magical that shouldn't be public. So just as we walk around the screen, we have like a red, Revit add-ins, like every large firm has um, a, a tool to manage our Revit models, which we'll talk about what are some of the problems of, especially at the firm level, what open source tools, this is a perfect example of a very powerful tool that might be nearly impossible for another firm to adopt. Um, the most targeted tool we've ever made to, to get open source first is this HOK Elastic tool. So Elastic is a search engine. This is a, a set of libraries that make it easy to manage um, permissioned file systems. It's quite a boring thing, but all firms have projects, projects have permissions. The existing tools in the market didn't do that. So we ended up building our own, but it, it, like I said before, um, we wanted to just default to an open position. And um, it's not IFC 5, anything like that, but we're doing experiments on um, a data structure that we think can help inform that work. And we're doing that inside of HOK to, you know, apply it to non-IFC topics, but we're also doing that work open source as well. So the user firm led challenges, uh, there's benefits and challenges definitely, but um, projects are very firm specific. I mentioned mission control in the previous page. You know, uh, we built it to set it up in our infrastructure. It uh, It is being modernized, but there was no reason for us to modernize it. And at the same time, we never wrote down the, the setup instructions or made sure that you could change the office list and these sort of things uh, easily. So it's um, the code is often open, but not easy to use is um, the point there. Um, you'll find when you look at uh, Git repos or something like that, uh, repositories for firms, that you'll find duplicate projects. Um, this happens quite a bit, especially in the Rhino Grasshopper community. But really this point of we don't often coordinate across projects is that, well, I had a custom need, so we built it and I, I as an individual or as a firm thought it was a, the same thing to do and that results in many libraries doing the same thing. And at the end of the day, that results in mass, the vast majority of these libraries being open source, but not being used and roughly abandoned um, on platforms. So, as we start to talk through this and shift to a different kind of model, one of the things I want to just sort of make the distinction from is um, uh, it's always good in this discussion to to level set the definitions. Uh, source available is one of these things that I 
was a not really aware of, but it didn't know what to call something. And I think the best the best example of this is Unreal. So source available is an example of tools that have source code available. You can get Unreal, you can get the source code. Um, you can review it and modify it. But the real difference here is um, there's this secondary set of terms that governs it govern its use and access. Uh, basically, that means um, the source code for Unreal is available because that's the way the game industry often works. But if you make money off of it, you still have to pay on Unreal. So it's not actually uh, open source in the sense you can do whatever the uh, uh, with ever want you will with the software. There are some terms that sit on top of software access where a pure open source license would allow, um, you know, you can use it and modify it and then you get all different variations. But it's all about what you can do with the software not about a financial arrangement. And that's the sort of difference here. You know, we'll uh, we'll hear from Antonio later today. He uses a, I don't know why this is lowercase, should be uppercase MIT license um, for IFG, IFCJS. But if we looked at things like Blender um, or, you know, uh, Blender BIM, because it's made up of a bunch of things that actually have several licenses that might be more strict. Um, and this is an important aspect to, to realize that um, open source means a lot of things. It could mean that um, it's the source code is available, but if you touch it, make changes, you have to give it back. You have to do a lot of uh, sort of work, or you can make commercial software and nobody cares. These are all uh, available licenses. And going back to the sort of IFC discussion, it's really good to sort of make this small distinction that open standards are actually most of the time not open source, and that's intense intentional. And what I'm the main point there is, you know, you want a standard not to change on anybody's whim. So if you made standards open source, people could just change them all the time. So the the processes in open standards tend to be open and made um, made available. Um, some ISO standards you certainly have to pay for, but Building Smart has a special arrangement to not require that. But at the end of the day, the, there's this small distinction that's an, a key thing to make is you don't want open source standards, you want open standards that are freely available and then open source software that can take that data and, you know, sort of do what with it would do what we what you, with you will uh, that and so that's the sort of key key distinction between standards and sort of open source licenses there. Um, if you want to fall, fall down the rabbit hole of licenses, you could go to the open source in initiative website and just look through them. This is an example of the most popular ones. You see uh, uh, Apache and um, uh, MIT is a common one, but this is a sort of a laundry list. Um, if you feel like learning something fun, um, the word Apache has nothing to do with the Native American or First Nation term. It's a Apache web service that they had the patch all the time. So it's an interesting bit of trivia. If you want the more interesting version of the, the drama, you could search on the internet for Linus Torvald GPL2 versus GPL3 and, and get some of the, how do you say this, uh, insight into the politics. Linus Torvald is the inventor of Linux, and the community around that is sort of far from singular-minded on what's the best license for it, but it's a, how do you say that, a more entertaining way to consume that, that knowledge. So let's talk about uh, a slightly different per approach, which is user-led and sort of trying to replace or sort of supplant current tools. And this is, there aren't that many of these examples, but the best one uh, you can definitely point to is sort of Blender BIM. Um, I, I would say that uh, IFCJS, we'll talk here about that later, might fall into this category. Um, and I think the point of saying this separately is this is user-led and it's trying to do a very heavy lift of replace something like a Revit or a, at least augment it substantially. And it's it's a, a a good another or another good example of what happens a lot in the open source community where it's actually built on top of Blender, which it itself was at one time a commercial project that was open sourced, is now getting funded and getting a lot of development effort. And so Blender BIM's building on top of that. Um, it's it's probably one of these, these things that you just have to look at like another piece of software, like being open source doesn't make it easy to implement or take on a incumbent. So I think it's a, you know, sort of an important aspect to, 
internalized that just becomes something that was available just because something's available in an open source way doesn't mean it's necessarily easy to adopt. And then um, commercial open source. And this is something you see everywhere in outside of the um, AEC space. You know, every, you know, the Microsofts, the Googles, all of these companies make open source software and they do that intentionally. Most of the time they want you to uh, use their services and make it easy to do that. So they make the tooling and libraries that make it simple to talk to, you know, um, uh, Google Analytics or something like that. They want to make that available. So they make the tools to do that easily. And then they also do other projects that are purely infrastructure, but are also just open source because it's sort of that way that community works. Our industry is, is um, coming to it, but it, again, it's always good to sort of give some background knowledge. And if anybody's ever seen me present, I like to talk about cats every once in a while in a presentation. So this is the perfect opportunity to do that. Um, so everybody that's heard of this topic is here to heard of a platform called GitHub. So GitHub uses an open source technology also developed by Linus Torvald called Git. So uh, it's this two two things coming together. So this is the open source. You can do it with, with what you want. Um, but the actual you know, sort of commercial implementation takes this open source thing and builds on top of it. So what you're seeing on the screen is the early sketches of if anybody in the room is, it's, we don't have the, a good way to do a raise of hands, at least I can't see it. Um, uh, this is actually a mix of a, a cat and an octopus. Again, a little bit background knowledge uh, that uh, the octopus is actually called an uh, octocat because of an octo merge in GitHub or in Git. So, but it, I think this is a perfect example of uh, marrying a commercial application with an open source approach. And um, I think the most successful versions of these handle this well. It's where you try to make commercial use really hard. That's where we see the um, industry sub, uh, sometimes struggle. And it's actually a perfect example as we move into the sort of the examples because um, they're taking an approach which is trying to be very open and amenable to commercial use. So just two examples in this first screen. Hypebar, this is a startup that's trying to do, um, it's hard to describe, you, well, you can read the text, but a next gen generation platform in the web. So you can go to their website, you can use their tools, get right uh, right tools for their platform, but they've decided, and I think rightfully so, that all the tooling and the the schema and the software that makes not the web page but the execution of the stuff, they've made it open source and they've used a very permissible license. An MIT license is a permissible permissible license. So basically, as long as you give credit to them, you could take it, make a competitive product. You could you know, change it, you could do whatever you want, as long as you said, well, like uh, give credit to Hypebar that built in the first place. And in a more um, historically stodgy area, um, Bentley is trying to do a similar thing with their I, uh, iTwin JS technologies. So it's not fully open source, just like Hypebar is not, everything Hypebar is not open source. They're trying to make the, make the effort to transition tools. So just like the big tech companies that people will build tools on top of their platform. And they, these basically fall into the same pattern. And lastly, I think the most, um, potentially the most uh, visible one, at least people that are trying to go from Revit and Rhino often, or um, you know, some other tools is something like Speckle. I don't think it has a high user base, but it does have a high number of people or a high number of contacts with bigger firms. I work for a bigger firm, so that's probably the case. They're a commercial, all open source, also MIT. Um, they're not commercial yet in the, in the fact they charge you money, but you can clearly see there's a business that they're trying to build on top of such a thing like this. So the point around why would you do something commercial open source is, um, you know, and what are the challenges is it, most companies need support. And this is a big, big topic for an open source tooling. You know, having a tool available is one thing, but if 
if it breaks, who do I call and actually get it fixed? That's a big deal. And so that's why these commercial open source models are pretty lively. Um, they're most likely to have more funding so they can move faster. Um, and it, in a lot of people's minds, they, you know, if you didn't know uh, Hypebar or Speckle was open source, you would think it's just another piece of commercial software. So it's trying to blend the most um, typical models, let's say, uh, in our industry with the atypical ones. So at the end of the day, the, the key things I just wanted to walk through there is open source shows up a lot in our industry. We don't have tons of adoption of it, but we do have small examples, and especially in larger firms or individual developers that build tools. I think from a, an industry challenge perspective, that's all good. But when you, just like the big commercial products, when two, two open source projects don't talk to each other or invent the same data structures or you know um, invent the same approach to the same problem, you basically just ran into the same issue we have with, you know, a Revit and ARCHICAD, Revit and Evently, these, these sort of situations. So at least from my perspective, the, the effort we're going to it through is trying to find the pathway to make multiple um, tools. And this is not us building anything right now. It's, it's trying to figure out if there's a way to structure data in such a way that tens of tools can talk to the same thing, and, but you don't have to be an expert in all uh, all the bits of data. This is a sort of thing that uh, filters into the IFC discussion, but it also means like, you know, um, not every data piece of data should fit into one standard. Like um, payment and scheduling uh, doesn't shouldn't have to be crammed into IFC just to make it work in multiple tools. These are examples of those sort of discussions. So that's it. I'll pause.